We welcome you to Front Lines and welcome our viewers from across the United States, from Canada, from the Middle East, Europe, Australia, and of course, in Armenia and Artsakh. Today, we have a very special broadcast. It has been roughly four months since the start of the active hostilities and the attack by Azerbaijan, uh, coupled by Turkey against the whole line of contact against the Republic of Artsakh. In that, since the, in that time period, we have had on this program uh, over 50 uh, shows with over 60 guests. We've covered a range of topics uh, regarding Artsakh, regarding Armenia and the Armenian nation. We have learned that nations are indeed built during historic moments. And our nation is at this very moment in one of those historic phases. We are fortunate enough to be joined today by a guest who will be able to speak on a lot of issues that we have touched upon uh, regarding Artsakh and regarding the future of Artsakh. And I am happy to ask Dado to introduce our guest for today. Thank you, Karnik, and uh, good morning to everyone in Artsakh and Republic of Armenia. Good day, everyone, everywhere else, and good evening in the United States. Uh, indeed, it is our uh, distinct honor to have uh, our guest uh, to start off uh, this evening and to conclude this evening with uh, His Excellency, His Honor, the Foreign Minister of Republic of Artsakh, David Babayan. David Babayan, um, uh, by way of a background, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce him and uh, mention a few of his uh, accomplishments and service uh, to the nation. From uh, December uh, 2013, he has served as the head of the Central Information Department of the Artsakh Republic and has served as the Deputy Chief of Staff in the Office of the President of the Republic. Uh, he has also been an advisor uh, to the President on Foreign Relations. Uh, he was appointed on January 4th of this year, 2021, uh, to be the Minister of Foreign Affairs, previous to which, uh, as I uh, stated, he was an advisor on foreign relations to the Republic. Uh, he is uh, the founder and current leader of the Artsakh Conservative Party. And um, uh, by, way of uh, by way of education, he holds uh, several degrees, uh, a degree in economics from Yerevan Institute of National Economy, a master's of arts from American University of Armenia, a degree of master's of arts from the Central European University Budapest, a, doctoral, uh, a doctorate in historical science from Armenian National Academy of Sciences. Uh, by way of his career background, he has been uh, since 2004, a lecturer at Artsakh State uh, University in political science and geopolitics. From 1998 until 2007, he was a lecturer at the Russian Armenian University lecturing in law. He has published more than 300 books and monographs of scientific research in the areas of Azerbaijani, Karabakh, Artsakh conflict settlement, Caucasian geopolitics, great power competition, and Chinese geopolitics. In parallel with those positions, with these positions rather, he has also held positions in government ministries of the Artsakh Republic, including previously in uh, early 2000 and 2001, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Presidential Planning Group, uh, assistant to the president in the mid-2005, six and seven, head of the Central Information Department of the Office of the President from 2007 until 2021. And he, in, in his capacity as foreign minister, he has already sent letters to the United Nations in, his, in the few short weeks that he's been uh, on his post. Uh, United Nations, the Council of Europe, and the co-chairs of the OSCE Minsk Group, uh, all of which highlighting the illegal detention of Armenian servicemen and civilians in the Republic of Azerbaijan. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, he is the founder of the uh, Artsakh Conservative Party, which uh, he founded and has been the chair of since uh, April of 2019. He does have awards. I'll mention just a couple of them. Artsakh Republic Vachagan Barebash State Medal and the diplomatic rank of Ambassador Extraordinary Plenipotentiary. Uh, Plenipotentiary. And among his publications, the issue of water within the context of Nagorno-Karabakh, political history of the Karabakh uh, Khanate within the context of Ar Artsakh Armenian diplomacy, modern Chinese geopolitics, Chinese policy in Central Asia, the Caucasus and Northern Caspian Sea region, the role and place of the Armenian plateau in biblical geopolitics, hydro policy of the Azerbaijani-Karabakh conflict, conflict, and I can go on. Um, 
Mr. Uh, Minister Babayan, uh, it, is, it is truly uh, an honor uh, to have you as our guest. And in fact, it is an honor of the people of the Republic of Artsakh and all Armenians throughout the globe that you have remained and continue to be of service uh, to our homeland. Pariyegazek. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to, to be with you to discuss a lot of issues uh, which are uh, much more important, especially now in this period of time. So I'm ready to join the discussions and if there are any questions, any problems you want to, to be clarified, please. I am here and ready to answer everything. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And, and uh, I think that we couldn't have had a more fitting guest today because I think your historical back, your background in history and in a number of other disciplines is particularly suited to the absolutely crucial moment that we are experiencing right now uh, in Artsakh. Indeed, it's not just Artsakh, but the entire Armenian nation uh, is watching and is involved. I wanted to ask you that in these, you know, it has been... Uh, almost four weeks since your appointment and crucially so much has changed in the in the historical and uh, geopolitical landscape um, what can you tell us about some of your uh, material foreign policy initiatives in this in this new reality that we find ourselves in today well the the period is indeed crucial and we face uh, a lot of challenges of course, any challenge is a threat, but it's also an opportunity, an opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, make real a lot of aspirations and, um, you know, maybe somehow avoid a lot of difficulties because uh, indeed problems and ordeals, uh, irrespective of their scale anyway, they leave several windows of opportunity. So right now, Artsakh, you know, uh, after all those things, uh, the territory has shrunk substantially, uh, but the most important consequences and causes and, uh, you know, uh, what happened to us, the losses are these several thousand young people who uh, have given their lives for, for the freedom and security of the nation. Uh, these are uh, probably the uh, most uh, you know, difficult challenge we face because uh, this kind of losses for such a small people as Armenian people and Artsakh is a too heavy burden. As to territories, territories uh, now present day Artsakh, uh, probably never ever in history we had such a small territory. You know, but uh, on the other hand, this uh, dictates us to be stronger, to uh, be, you know, uh, more professional, we must be so to, you know, face the challenges. Because when you find yourself in a situation which is uh, pulls apart from what we had several months ago, and you have uh, a totally new security environment with old actors, with uh, you know, unchanged aspirations of those actors and your potential has shrunk. And so you have to take into consideration all those things. Uh, currently, one of the most important imperatives which we must uh, carry out and realize is to maintain uh, the um, you know, subjectivity the, uh, of Artsakh. So Artsakh should remain a geopolitical subject should remain a geopolitical player in the region. Um, uh, Minister Babayan, uh, you, you, uh, I, you, you took the words out of my mouth because those are your words that I had adopted. You had said Artsakh should preserve its subjectivity. That is exactly what you just repeated. 
But you also went on and said, stay a self-governed country uh, uh, as an orderly and imperative that Artsakh preserve its status as a geopolitical subject. Could you elaborate what do you mean by that, remaining uh, a geopolitical subject? I understand the self-governed country part, but what do you mean uh, overall with those thoughts? Look, uh, in general, the Azerbaijani Karabakh conflict is uh, one of the most important parts of Transcaucasian geopolitics. And uh, the Southern Caucasus or, or Transcaucasia uh, is a very important geopolitical region because uh, all the processes which are taking place here, uh, the, uh, I mean, it, it, uh, the echo of those processes uh, goes beyond, far beyond the region. I mean, uh, the greater geopolitical space in Central Asia, in Siberia, in Northern Caucasus, in Middle East, uh, are directly connected with the Southern Caucasus. So if uh, here we have changes, especially changes in geopolitical balance, then the repercussions and all the, those consequences will be automatically felt in the uh, adjacent and much greater space. So even in this capacity, when Artsakh is now uh, only 20% of what we used to be, let's say several months ago, but even in this capacity, we continue to play a very crucial role as a geopolitical subject. Suppose uh, there, there is no Artsakh as an Armenian state, you know, uh, as uh, even non-recognized state. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the uh, configuration of geopolitical you know, balances of, of uh, the interests uh, of plays of different actors would be substantially changed. Transcaucasian region would become a bridge, a corridor for pan-Turkism to spread, for example, to many, many other, you know, regions. If we are here and we, we are alive, even in this kind of situation when Artsakh is like a wounded you know person uh, who has lost one of its legs one of the arm uh, an eye severely wounded you know but it's still alive if we are alive so there is a chance to recover and there is a possibility to continue to keep you know how to keep you know preserving our status as a geopolitical subject it's very important you know Minister this is uh, forgive me, go ahead, continue, please. I didn't yeah, yeah, please, no, no, uh, uh, I'm ready. I hear you say what you say, uh, and Carnegie is the international lawyer, so I'm going to, I'm going to interpret it and, and ask Carnegie to uh, follow up. Uh, what I hear you say is that Artsakh is so much more than what it is for us Armenians, because we've always understood that Artsakh's uh, security is vital to Armenia's security. But what I'm hearing you say, Minister, is that Artsakh's viability and remaining alive, whether it's 20% of what it was or not, uh, it's important to the security of the entire region and the viability uh, of the uh, far greater um, uh, distances than the immediate, immediate geography. Is that what I'm understanding? Is that correct, Karnik, Minister? Well, uh, when we are talking about the importance of Artsakh, we have to, of course, look uh, to this importance in uh, several, from several perspectives. One is a kind of a pan-Armenian significance. We can uh, touch upon this issue a little bit later. But now we are talking about foreign policy and our main objectives. Of course, Artsakh plays a great role and uh, it, it had it uh, has a great significance for many other actors. This is the fact, and we have to understand that. As to the Armenian people, then of course Artsakh continues to play a very important role. You see, it's uh, for Armenian people, 
um, one of the most important, crucial, not only geopolitical, geonational, I don't know, uh, psychological, political imperatives is um, to uh, preserve uh, self-confidence. It's a kind of soft power, but it's a very strong soft power. Mm -hmm. Look at our surrounding. We have Turkey, 85 million people gigantic army of 700,000 men. I mean, it's a standing army. It's without the mobiliza mobilization resources. Azerbaijan, 10 million people, you see? And we are in between, sandwiched between these two much bigger, uh, you know, countries, which are, uh, uh, which could be called adversaries or enemies, you see? But they are uh, not, a, uh, not a fraternal countries, of course. So from material point of view, we will be enabled to compensate this kind of imbalance, but to somehow keep the balance, we, had, uh, we have, we must maintain great self-confidence. Uh, you see it, the soul of Armenianness. And for many years, for uh, many centuries, because Armenia was, uh, the, the statehood was, uh, was lost for several hundreds of years, you see, and we became uh, slaves on our own territory. It was indeed the real, real situation. Unlike the Jewish people who migrated all over the world, we remained mainly on, in our own territory, but, uh, Actually, we uh, lost our independence and we became kind of, you know, uh, people who were uh, under the rule of, of uh, different other people and nations. So it started to uh, forge a uh, complex of victim in our mind, mm -hmm. maybe a complex of inferiority to some extent, which culminated after the 1915 genocide because at that time we lost four fifths of our historical land, material and cultural, everything. Our nation uh, just was spread all over the world. And it was a, to some extent, it was a great idea of preserving national identity, the, uh, you know, memories of genocide, but these memories are a victimizing memory. And with such a victimizing uh, psychology, it, it is very difficult to some extent, even impossible to survive in this kind of geopolitical situation. This is why we needed some kind of, I don't know, uh, a, a impetus, uh, maybe divine impetus to uh, return self-confidence. And it was the Artsakh movement in 1988 which actually, and, and the uh, consequences of that movement, the first war, etc., where we won and we actually proved, first of all, to ourselves that we are able to defend and to defeat much stronger enemy. So it was a very important idea which helped us survive and develop in this kind of situation. Of course, uh, it is impossible to be totally self-sufficient geopolitically and militarily and economically. So we, we must wage a very um, you know, balanced and clever foreign policy. This is why Artsakh plays a crucial role. Even after the third Artsakh war, I call it third war because the first one was uh, in uh, 1991, 1994, the second was the April war and the third was this one. We, we uh, well, I can say the following. We, uh, we were not defeated by Azeris and by Turks. It was a defeat uh, which we suffered from our own, uh, uh, you know, complexes. This bad uh, negative, phenomena which uh, have been following our nation for hundreds of years. You see this egoism, this loss of face, uh, 
you know, uh, when we prefer our individual interest to the public, etc., etc. When people say that there are no eternal enemies and friends, well, we can agree on the part of nations and states, but there are eternal enemies like these kind of things, envies, uh, envy, you know, uh, lack of faith, egoism, etc., 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 non-professional approach, you see, and these are uh, the challenges, and these are uh, the main winners, so to say, of this struggle, you see, and we have to understand that, to comprehend that this is the main enemy of our nation. If we can overcome and defeat these kind of enemies, then uh, in, in uh, let's say, other fields and other directions, we will be much safer and we will record so many victories that we even don't imagine now. Mr. Minister, I, I think that um, clearly you've identified the inherent geopolitical value and more so the inherent Armenianness, or the Armenian identity value that Artsakh brings. In fact, in some of your other discussions, you have even referred to it as holding a sacred place in the concept of the Armenian nation. And I think that those of us uh, who uh, remember the second and the first uh, Gharapah war uh, and understand the, the, the Artsakh moment, let me say, that uh, uh, which changed the psyche of the Armenian individual globally, globally, not just in Artsakh, not just in Armenia, but globally. All of a sudden, there was a narrative of strength, of self-sufficiency, of future. Uh, and I think I'm, I have to say, I'm very uh, uh, pleased uh, at the fact that you have approached it from that angle, number one, but also uh, have identified the fact that value still remains, that, that, that being on the ground, having even though it's 20%, but being there, being an entity, if you will, and I think that was probably the, the, the transliteration or the translation from the, from the word subject, uh, you know, an actual a geopolitical entity um, has, uh, has a really significant value. You've touched on something in your discussion now that I think is really important. You've, you've hinted at the idea of professionalism, and you've also mentioned the idea of nationalism. And I think I'd like to talk to you about how you see the cleverness uh, of our people, of our nation, of Artsakh in particular, combining those two elements of professionalism and a sense of Asga Sirutun, if you will, uh, in, in Armenian, a sense of nation, national pride and identity. Um, this is a theme that I've heard you speak of uh, in, in, in other settings. And I have to say, it's a very attractive concept could you expound on that and explain that a little bit more about how you see the combination of professionalism and an understanding of national identity in the service of, uh, of the future of Artsakh? Well, uh, these are, uh, you are right, uh, crucial components of our state building and must be, so to say, if we uh, somehow, you know, neglect them, uh, then uh, it will, uh, lead to unpredictable consequences or consequences like this. When we are talking about um, national identity, national pride, here we have to be, um, you know, uh, very much precise. And uh, it's very important not to replace patriotism with nationalism. Mm. Because nationalism is a uh, one of the uh, deviations, one of the patterns of fascism, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit softer. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because, uh, for example, when I, I'm also, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a uh, lecturer in several universities, and I always bring the following example to my students in order to distinguish between nationalism and patriotism. I say, when you like your people, you love your people, 
it doesn't mean that this love should be at the expense of hatred towards any other people. So I, uh, I always put this, this example. I say to them, I put on the table a three months old Azerbaijani kid. Come and kill him. If somebody is going to raise its hand on a little baby, irrespective of their nationality and kill him or her. He's not a human being. How can he be a patriot mm -hmm. of his or her nation? So patriotism is not hatred. It doesn't mean that we have to kill innocent infants, you see, or, or prisoners of war, or I don't know, old people, anybody who is unable to defend himself so this is why we have to be extremely extremely precise and cautious not to uh, you know uh, intermingle these two ideas mm -hmm. because it could lead to a very bad consequences nationalism uh, is a very bad thing patriotism is something which we need it, it means that we have to love our people. We have to understand uh, some basic ideas, negative phenomena, negative traits, which we have as a nation. And we have for many hundreds of years. Take, for example, the book of Master of, Mas uh, of uh, Moses Horenazi, and just read whatever he wrote about uh, the loss of Armenian kingdom. Mm -hmm. The situation is very much alike mm -hmm. what we have now. See, and we, this is why we have to cultivate the idea of patriotism. Uh, you know, it minister, means, oh, yeah. No, 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 please continue, please, please. I, yeah, I, it's I, a, I know what I'm going to say, so please continue your thought. It's, it's a very, on one hand, it's a very easy thing. On the other hand, it's it's uh, very much difficult because uh, easy from a uh, technical point of view, uh, because we need uh, to elaborate, for example, appropriate school programs, start from kindergartens, from families, etc., in universities, schools, colleges, army, uh, everywhere. But difficult because uh, ideas especially such great ideas, also requires uh, some kind of suffering. Because people are uh, very much prone to make a lot of mistakes, especially uh, if it's uh, something, uh, you see, if there is a temptation to do that. But we have to understand that the consequences could be very uh, dangerous. Uh, you see, for example, if a person, he may have uh, a very good, uh, let's say, education or whatever, be a good professional. But if uh, he or she has, uh, you know, um, problems with, um, let's say, with, uh, his, uh, with values, mm. then it, uh, these kind of people may become much uh, more dangerous enemies than the outer enemies. If a, a person is, I mean, has a very high morale and a good value system, but he's not professional, then the work will not go on. So we need to uh, carry out a very uh, sophisticated personal policy to, to elect, to e somehow select maybe uh, people with appropriate values. It's very difficult to do because especially now, in this global world when uh, people are moving here and there. But within this context, we need very much, you know, pan-Armenian coordination. Because you see, Armenian people is a mono-ethnic people. It, it uh, this uh, kind of uh, specifics uh, has positive and negative sides. Mm -hmm. Positive because we maintain our national unity, our values, etc. Negative because we could be isolated by ideas, by uh, approaches, etc. But this has been compensated by 
uh, our diaspora because our diaspora is uh, multicultural and it can bring different ideas to the motherland. So this, this, in this way, we uh, maintaining our mono-ethnic composition could become multicultural. Mm -hmm. And this is also a very important thing. This is also, uh, especially in case of Artsakh uh, and the fact that Artsakh is a sacred place for the Armenian people, it also increases our geopolitical value because Artsakh, um, right now, you see, till now we actually used our potential in uh, probably one way. For example, asking diaspora to consolidate, to help, uh, you know, Artsakh recoveries to, you know, carry out different political projects in recognition of Artsakh, in recognition of uh, the Armenian genocide, et cetera, et cetera. But it's only one key element of this potential. There are other things too, which we can apply. And other states also understand this. This is why it's very important to keep Artsakh alive, to contribute to its recovery. And uh, by this, we will maintain our geopolitical value and still we have a very great geopolitical value, but we have to use it to apply it. Mm -hmm. Here we need patriots and professionals. Only these categories can uh, bring to maximum the assets of this kind of potential. Minister Babayan, uh, you, uh, <clears throat> you referred to multi multiculturalism. Earlier, you spoke about uh, the Artsakh movement. Uh, you referenced the three wars. Uh, I can say that uh, as far as uh, we are concerned, Carnegie and I, and, uh, and the organization that we have served within the Armenian Bar Association, uh, my recollection, my engagement, uh, takes me back to the second war, uh, the, the April 2016. Before that, in terms of engagement with Artsakh Republic and all the way until today, this evening, speaking with you. Uh, to the extent that you are uh, a native born of Artsakh, by my account, uh, a teenager during the Artsakh uh, movement of the uh, 1980s, uh, and having grown up, remained, and engaged in service and continuing to serve, I have noted that um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs under your leadership, just this last 20, I wanna say 25 days, uh, has already been engaged in diplomatic, what I refer to diplomatic combat perhaps, against cultural genocide and cultural terrorism that is being carried out um, by Azerbaijan against Artsakh. Uh, Patriotism is, uh, is a better choice any day uh, than a nationalism, one that borders on fascism and worse, perhaps. Uh, what, what do you see the immediate imperatives for the people of Artsakh, for the Armenian people of the world <clears throat> to rise up and not get into the ego and the, and the uh, me, me, me versus you, 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 uh, illness that we suffer from and uh, and get our forces together, get our resources together in the name and in the functional equivalency of practicing patriotism so that we put an end to what is going on from, uh, from the cultural uh, desecrations. Uh, and I'm not even getting into the our, our, uh, Armenian uh, prisoners of war or uh, members of the defense army of Artsakh that uh, uh, we know still uh, some of whom are in uh, Azeri custody. What can we do? Well, uh, we have to uh, work a lot. This is the key issue here. Uh, as uh, to Azerbaijani policy, they, uh, their stance has not changed. Mm -hmm. 
they, they have become more aggressive, especially after the outcomes of this war. But of course, it's other thing, uh, because uh, I am uh, confident in one thing, that a state, a nation which uh, makes fascism its ideology and basis of its state building process, uh, will never ever have a bright future in a long-term period. This uh, kind of ideologies ruins peoples and states from within, it's a fact. So it's a matter of time uh, that uh, this kind of ideologies will uh, one day bring to uh, severe consequences uh, for, for Azerbaijan and its leadership. It's definitely, it's a fact. Uh, it's like a cancer mm -hmm. when you, uh, or, or, or a plague rather, because if uh, there are symptoms of plague and it starts to develop and you don't want to do anything to cure that, your organism will definitely fail. It's a, it's, it's a, a general pattern. What they are doing is that they are uh, actually uh, infringing all uh, and violating all the norms and laws, international laws and norms. Uh, they are uh, not returning the prisoners of war. They call them terrorists. They, uh, you know, st uh, start criminal cases against them, which are illegal from the point of view of international law. But this state is a state where, uh, where fascism and uh, Racism is at the core at, of, or it's a core of their state building philosophy. They are destroying our cultural heritage. And uh, you see, to some extent, it's also the result of the inability of international institutions to react on such kind of things. I remember what they did with Juha Hachkars, mm -hmm. just destroying everything. And the entire international community saw it. So what? Basically nothing. And well, now they're doing sorry. the same with uh, all this heritage, all the pieces of our culture and history, which are under their control. Uh, but Some, minister, no, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, Minister, you are the representative of the people of the Republic of Arsakh because you're the Minister of Foreign Affairs. That's a very important position to hold. Uh, and, and since it seems that uh, uh, the consensus or, or, or this uh, triumvirate of Armenia, Azerbaijan and Russia have decided that there'll be 2000 Russian peacekeepers in Arsakh and, and, and the areas are gonna be uh, patrolled by uh, Russian peacekeepers, are you able to communicate uh, with your counterpart in Moscow in the name of the people of Artsakh? Because at the end of the day, it seems that Armenia is not supposed to be in Artsakh. Artsakh is Artsakh, 20% that is left of it. Uh, are you given an opportunity to speak uh, on behalf of the people of Artsakh? Or are you being uh, uh, given the runaround and, uh, and not, because I'm a strong proponent that, you know, in, just like in 1994 in the Bishkek uh, protocols, uh, Artsakh was a party participant, that Artsakh must, in the final analysis, must be a party participant in a decision uh, that people refer to as a final solution. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you see, uh, here, when talking about this, uh, I mean, this cultural heritage, it's very related to what we, you have said. We see that it is basically impossible to protect them on international level, engaging international mechanisms. But we uh, must continue this process. Another way and probably much more effective way to protect at least several, uh, uh, you know, pieces of yeah. our cultural heritage is uh, through the communication with the Russian side, Russian peacekeepers. And you see, it was a personal initiative of President Putin uh, to protect 
some sacred places, churches and cultural heritage pieces. Due to this, for example, we can keep Dadivang safe, a place which is sacred for the entire Armenian people. It was uh, only because the Russian president became the guarantor, like the guarantor of, of this, of, of the security of this place and safety. And Minister, um, along the lines of that, and, and, I, and I was looking to get to this question, I think it might be a good time. The change in the geopolitics has replaced in some respects, uh, Russia for Armenia in terms of the guarantor of security to some degree of the, uh, of, uh, of the Artsakh Republic. Um, what do you see as, you know, Artsakh is in a very unique position here uh, because the, the, arrangement has, the arrangements have changed. Uh, there are clear uh, historical, cultural ties, obviously, with Armenia, very important ties. Uh, under the terms of the trilateral statement, uh, the Armenian forces had to withdraw and Russian peacekeepers, as Dado said, uh, came in. Um, and clearly, as you just mentioned, there are real material gains to be had by proper, uh, I would call perhaps even internal diplomacy uh, between the Republic of Artsakh and the Russian peacekeepers, as well as uh, Artsakh and the Republic of Armenia. The paradigm has changed somewhat. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that role means? What, is, what are the core uh, underpinnings to the Artsakh-Russia relationship today? And what are the core underpinnings to the Artsakh-Armenia relationship today? Look, uh, remember all, at the beginning of our meeting, we talked about our geopolitical surrounding, about our place, the impossibility of being self-sufficient mm -hmm. in terms of uh, military security, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, we, we have to be, again, patriotism and professionalism are the two most important, crucial components of our survival. Mm. Because uh, you see, uh, patriotism is uh, not only when you are uh, making toasts, you know, saying, uh, drinking for motherland, saying these kind of things, or uh, trying to present yourself much bigger than you are in the reality. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the problem is that we must have a real foreign policy, uh, not virtual one. You see, you can be uh, sometimes in a social network on Facebook or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, virtuality is a dominant thing. You see, but reality and geopolitics is a very dangerous uh, field, you see. This is why we must have, we must have fraternal relations with Russia. Not because it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and not to take into consideration that somebody may think that it's not correct or whatever. Uh, let me explain you my vision. Uh, first of all, we have uh, centuries of fraternal relations with the Russian people and the Russian state. Don't forget that the liberation of Armenia, uh, especially at this last stage, uh, the, you know, the national liberation movement before the collapse of Soviet Union, which started in uh, 18th, uh, even 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, was directly connected with Russia. Besides, we all, uh, besides, we have uh, a lot of common things in culture, in way of life, in our thinking, you know, and in geopolitical uh, you know, okay. approaches, yeah. Besides, Armenian people and Armenia in general, I mean, our state has a very important asset which helps um, avoid a lot of, uh, you know, consequences, dangerous consequences co uh, concerning 
keeping balance between different states. This is our diaspora. I mean, we must maintain good relations, must, with all the states where we have Armenian diaspora. Many other countries don't have such kind of asset. You, you see, because if somebody says, why you maintain, for example, good relations with Iran, especially our Western partners, we say because one thing is our cultural and other ties, geopolitical interest. Another, most imp one of the most important components is the Armenian diaspora in Iran, in, in Lebanon, in United States, in France. So you see, it gives us flexibility. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the most dangerous thing if we can neglect this fact. Uh, look at our surrounding. I mean, we have Turkey, again, 85 million people, 700,000 troops, standing troops. They can bring uh, their army to, let's say, 20 million people within two weeks. And there are some people in Armenia who pose themselves as a patriots, who are saying that the Russian military base should be taken out from Armenia. I mean, guys, are you crazy? Don't you see who is our neighbor? Mm -hmm. Either you are crazy. Second, you don't understand the reality or you are playing another, not Armenian game. So we have to be extremely, extremely professional. Not to, um, you know, be led by, uh, you know, provocators and people who don't understand the reality, you see? So professionalism and patriotism are the two crucial things which can, which um, help overcome egoism, overcome, uh, uh, you know, this kind of passion uh, and bring us and put us on a correct path to, towards, you know, materializing our interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Minister, uh, you, uh, 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 you are making your uh, vision very clear and your logic behind it uh, uh, is, is very apparent. Uh, I hear what you're saying and I don't disagree with what you're saying in terms of uh, Russia you know, those who think Russia should be out of uh, uh, Armenian territories altogether uh, do not seem to understand the value of Russia to Armenia and Artsakh. Uh, but at the same time, Minister, you have uh, had a, uh, a sense of a wider reach, it appears, because you have you have written to the UN Secretary General, you've written a letter, I believe two, three days ago, to the UNESCO director about the cultural deliberate destruction of Armenian cultural heritage. But what I was most um, fixated on, I must admit, that uh, about a week ago, you wrote, uh, or, or the ministry, your ministry, uh, wrote to the European Parliament. And in that communication to the Europe, European Parliament, um, uh, you applauded them for, you know, investigating war crimes uh, and, and bringing those uh, responsible to justice. You, um, uh, you agreed with the international investigation into the presence of uh, alleged foreign fighters during the 44-day war. Uh, you welcomed the European Parliament's support for uh, the OSCE mink for a comprehensive settlement. Uh, and... Uh, you also uh, joined the European Parliament's condemnation of the destabilizing role of Turkey. Those are, those are direct quotes, if you will, paraphrased from your communication, your ministry's communication. Uh, and uh, so I was beginning to think, well, is Minister Babayan thinking that the European Parliament or United Nations uh, can, uh, can play a real significant role, especially because I can only speak for myself, I was very disheartened because OSCE, France, US and Russia, well, two out of the three are members of NATO 
And there there was their other member of NATO, Turkey, uh, committing every possible uh, war crime. And I could say it, you may uh, not be in a position to say it, but I don't want to speak for you. Um, what was most impressive, and I want, I want your thoughts against all of this lengthy background I gave you. You also, the ministry uh, under your leadership said, we are convinced that a comprehensive and just settlement of the azerbaijan Karabakh conflict can be achieved on the basis of recognition of the right to self-determination realized by the people of Artsakh and the deoccupation of the territories of the Republic of Artsakh. What did you mean by that? Deoccupation in the hopes that one day we will be uh, self-sufficient without uh, Russian uh, assistance on the ground? Uh, because there are also those who I don't agree with, I, I, I don't want to agree with, who say, well, Artsakh will be a Russian protectorate at best. I know I threw a lot at you, Minister. Uh, it's because I'm, uh, my day job is a lawyer and not an interviewer or a discussant. But if you can comment on any of those. You see, uh, the uh, wise civilization uh, again, has to bring, especially in the time of ordeal, emotions to minimum. It doesn't mean that we uh, have to, we don't have to have values. Mm -hmm. No, values and emotions are two different things. Maybe they have many things in common, but they are different things. So now one of the most important things is to save Artsakh. Mm -hmm. How can we do that? Of course, by our own potential and uh, by the help of our fraternal nations. Mm -hmm. When we, I say by our own potential, this means also Armenia, diaspora, Artsakh together, because, uh, you know, Armenia and the diaspora are and will be the foundations of our trinity, of Artsakh's statehood, past, present, and future. But we also have to understand the reality that now uh, we are in a position where geopolitical balance, peace, and security to a great extent depends also on Russia's engagement. It doesn't mean that we are against other states, no, because we don't have such a right. We must maintain good relations with all the nations where we have Armenian diaspora. This is why we have to be, uh, to understand the reality. If you don't understand the reality in a proper way, uh, then, uh, this kind of distorted understanding may lead to catastrophe, you see? So what we have to do now, of course, we have to maintain this kind of fraternal ties with Russia, with other states. Of course, we have to apply to international organizations and, you know, um, inform about this Azerbaijani policy because what they are doing is not only against the Armenian people, these are crimes against humanity. If this case, this time, if now the international community again will not carry out appropriate steps to influence Azerbaijan and influence uh, and uh, stop this cultural genocide and culture of terrorism, then these cultural terrorists and uh, you know, genocide makers will knock their door tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, one day, because it's uh, especially in this globalized world, uh, the processes are so interconnected that you don't know when and how you will feel the outcomes and the consequences of your idleness tomorrow. This is why we are going to uh, keep uh, this kind of uh, you know, vector and uh, inform, apply to international community, to different uh, institutions about the fate of our prisoners of war, about this inhumane behavior of Azerbaijani side towards these people, about destruction of cultural heritage, because these, these are the most important 
uh, you know, um, kind of universal values, mm -hmm. which we have to protect here too. You see the terrorists came he here and fought against Artsakh and Armenia. Then we, we haven't seen appropriate reaction on the part of many international organizations. Tomorrow, this terrorist would go there. Yeah. Uh, Minister, this is the fact. Uh, Minister, I, I want to ask, uh, you know, we talked a lot about some of the philosophical and theoretical underpinnings uh, to what the foreign policy should look like or could look like. Um, and you've also hinted, not hinted, you've directly uh, spoken of the value of having a very real, real politic approach uh, to the geographical reality uh, that, that Artsakh is in and the Armenian people are in at this moment. Um, I think it's fair to say that on September 27th uh, and, and quickly in the days uh, thereafter, most of the army, especially in the Armenian diaspora, but largely across the Armenian nation, I feel woke up to a reality of the neighborhood that we live in that looks very different than the neighborhood that we believed we lived in. Uh, I feel as if we had a very uh, narrow understanding of a bilateral or trilateral issue within the South Caucasus. As you just alluded to, uh, the war brought the involvement of Israel, the involvement of Pakistan, the involvement of Syrian mercenaries. It demonstrated, as you were saying at the beginning, the geopolitical importance of the region. Uh, it, it showed the value of energy politics that plays into this. Um, and my question here is maybe a, a bigger question with respect to diplomacy. Going forward, uh, and, and, I, and I ask this uh, question, uh, not necessarily only in your capacity as, as foreign minister of Artsakh, but really as a, as a as a student as a, uh, of, of the larger historical and geopolitical reality that we sit in today. Are there new avenues uh, that we should be considering, uh, be it Southeast Asia, uh, be it relationships with, uh, you know, with uh, other players in the Middle East? Has the world, has our world, uh, because of the fifth generation war that was unleashed by Azerbaijan and Turkey, has our neighborhood gotten bigger? Is our, do we have to have a more uh, aggressive or fearless diplomacy that is a little bit more complex perhaps than it was on September 22nd, uh, 26th? I feel as if our you know, when I say our, I mean in terms of the Armenian nation's diplomatic approach really was about balancing, uh, you know, at its best, balancing two powers, right? You had Europe and the United States and, and Russia and playing some role in the middle of that. The world looks very different today from, from Artsakh and from Armenia. Um, players that we never imagined, we never imagined would be playing a role on the territory of the Republic of Artsakh played a very significant role. Clearly they were imported, clearly there were alliances that were not necessarily long-term alliances, but they were strategic alliances by, by Azerbaijan with Israel, Azerbaijan with Pakistan, Turkey with Israel, Turkey. The, what does the new diplomacy, if you will, the new diplomacy of the Armenian nation what does it look like going forward five years from now or 10 years from now? Are we gonna be playing with the same, uh, because you know, when you play with the same elements, you end up with the same results. Clearly there was, we need to perhaps take a more comprehensive view. Um, what do you see as possible new initiatives, new relationships that won't necessarily upset the strategic relationship that Armenia and Armenians and Artsakh have with Russia, but at the same time, uh, provide a, a little bit more uh, projection of, of sovereignty, projection of statehood uh, in a manner that would perhaps tip the scales, adjust the balance in our favor. Uh, you see, I think that in, in general, foreign policy should be the most, it's a field which should be the most realistic one. Uh, because it, it is very much, it is a derivative 
from the reality, from geographical locations, from different other things, which are uh, more or less constant, you see. Uh, it, it's much better to have a bird in your hand than two, five, six, seven in the bush. This is the problem that sometimes uh, and maybe frequently we were in a virtual reality. Mm. You see, but in general, if you want to uh, keep your geopolitical subjectivity, you have to understand where you are the most needed one, mm. with whom you have to construct at how the relations. You know, several uh, months ago in uh, during the last, in, in the last year, I don't remember exact time, but it was, if I'm not mistaken, in, in summer, I participated in one seminar. And there, there was a participant who uh, started to present, it was before the war, you see, long before that. They started to talk about importance of Armenia for, I don't know, for, 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 uh, Northern African countries or whatever. I mean, it's uh, it's something, it's very virtual. Hmm. What, what is the importance of Armenia for North African countries? I mean, such kind of uh, purely theoretical, virtual things are not only illogical, but but they could be very dangerous because you don't understand indeed your place and your significance. If uh, you go into this kind of uh, logic, you are guided with this kind of logic, you will not be able to face challenges. This is why I prefer a bird in, in my hand than, I don't know, an elephant in the bush so we have to be realistic. We have two, three traditional geopolitical uh, niches, which we have to, or we, we must keep mm. occupying this kind of niches. Other things are now not real. Now the most important thing is to preserve Armenianness of Artsakh. Mm. Because our presence here creates a one geopolitical reality. You know, our migration from Artsakh will create another, totally other geopolitical reality. So these are the most important 99.9% .9 of our geopolitical significance and what we have to do. Northern Africa, I don't know, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, they are very important regions, but our uh, significance is lies not within those spaces. We are here in Transcaucasus and we play a crucial role here. This is why now it's very important to assist the recovery of Artsakh. Because if we remain, Armenia would remain. Diaspora would keep its national identity. You know, being a true citizens of your countries. I think that any Armenian should be a devoted citizen of its host countries. It doesn't mean that you have to forget your motherland. No, but being a true citizen of, of your host country and maintaining your identity is the most effective way of helping the historical motherland, you see? So the most important thing is to keep Artsakh alive, to uh, somehow assist its recovery, be because this would uh, give us a chance to continue this great geopolitical game where we have our significant place. This is why now we have to, I don't want to say to uh, cut off many other visions or geopolitical directions, foreign policy directions, no, but we have to 
concentrate on the most important currents, not to go into the debris of other virtual things. And Minister, if, if I may, I just want to follow up on that real quickly, because at the beginning, you mentioned one of those uh, main roles that we play in the region, uh, and that, that is pantourism, right? We're a, we're a, we're a, uh, an obstacle to greater influence of Turkic peoples in the southern belt of, uh, of Russia. Um, the other uh, is, is likely some uh, element of, of uh, being a buffer state for Russia in terms of uh, threats from the south. Uh, I was going to ask you, what are some of the other, uh, you've mentioned a couple of times our geopolitical importance in the region. What are some other, uh, what are some of those other characteristics? What are some of the other roles that we play in the larger geopolitical, uh, in, in the regional geopolitical calcul calculus? What else, what else is there? Because I think that that's an important point that you raised. And I, and I think it's really important for our viewers to kind of understand what those contours are. Clearly, pan-tourism is one, the, you know, the, the, uh, the serving as a buffer uh, from, let's say, southern Islamic movements is another. What, is, what are the other, uh, what do you see as, as those kind of unique roles that Artsakh uh, and, in fact, the Armenians play in this geopolitical region? You see, uh, one of the crucial things is not to become a theater of geopolitical competition. Uh, I, I would say not a buffer state, but we are a key component in, may, in, in some geopolitical configuration. One of the most important thing is not to become a battlefield, a geopolitical battlefield, because we don't have such resources. So one thing is that, you know, the pan is a uh, ideology, it's a aggressive ideology with, which poses a threat to many countries, to Russia, to China, to Iran, to the same Israel. By the way, uh, in Israel, we have a, a very specific situation. I mean, some people in the government of Israel have close connections with Azerbaijani and Turkish circles, business circles or whatever. But the people, Jewish people, they share, we share with them a lot of common things in our destiny. And we see how uh, the general public in Israel, I mean, the Jewish people, how they suffered during this, the Karabakh war too. I mean, they, they were very much, you know, on, on our side as a uh, psychological, of course, which is also very important that we have to use that. Besides Armenia, Armenian people, Armenian statehood, we, we have a, a specific asset because we have a, we are a diasporic nation. It's a unique potential to become a place which can uh, somehow bring together or contribute to a dialogue between different other countries. We can have such a role. This is why we have to sing, maybe rethink and elaborate some new um, components of, of our geopolitical, uh, let's say, uh, importance. Uh, concentrate also on, uh, br uh, you know, somehow um, contributing to a dialogue between the West and Russia, Iran and the West, things like this, because we, we can have such a potential. It, it's a very important potential. Not all people have such a potential. But this kind of direction uh, has uh, never been even uh, used by our statehood for geopolitical purposes. I mean, our relations with the diaspora was mainly the psychological assistance to Artsakh and uh, this Armenian cause, etc. But it's only part of our huge potential. If we can use our potential from in, in other spheres too, it will definitely strengthen our subjectivity, geopolitical subjectivity in the region too. This is why uh, this kind of patriotic upbringing and education, uh, information is also very important in the diaspora by you guys and by people like you 
and I welcome very much such discussions be because it enables to at least, uh, you know, consider and talk about some possible ways which later on could become a practical steps. Mm -hmm. This is why uh, we, we have a lot of work to do. First of all, to do that, we need contacts. We must keep contacts, co constant, you know, ties. Always, uh, you know, keep some mm, discussion places where we can share views. Always, uh, you know, uh, try to see the reality in a, a very realistic way. Because we indeed have a very important geopolitical significance, but uh, we don't use all the components of that such significance at such a potential. Minister, you uh, you mentioned earlier, and this is my last uh, my last inquiry of you for the evening because of the time that we've taken. We could go on for hours with you. Um, so you mentioned about uh, preserving the Armenianness of Artsakh. Uh, as being a very important uh, objective, uh, we agree. Uh, to that end, uh, I read a report, I think a day ago or so, that there were more than 7,000 Artsakh children currently receiving education in Armenian schools in the Republic of Armenia. Uh, and that number varied. Uh, and um, that the, 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 because of the, some of the families were in various stages of uh, 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 repatriating and returning to Artsakh. Um, uh, it seems that preserving the uh, Armenianness of Artsakh would depend on the, uh, uh, the robust population of Artsakh. And to that end, um, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs under your leadership, uh, aside from diplomacy, uh, we certainly welcome and we have engaged with your uh, ministry for some time now. Uh, with respect to any efforts or any, uh, any needs that can be met from the diaspora to, uh, to enhance uh, the robust numbers of the residents of Artsakh, uh, to assist to the degree that is needed, uh, the wounded soldiers and the families. And I know that, you know, our, our historic Armenian um, mountainous city of Shushi uh, is not a place where... Uh, uh, compatriots can return to at the moment. Uh, so that uh, leaves the door open for much more uh, uh, need for housing. What's ahead in terms of repopulating Artsakh and what's ahead generally for the ministry under your leadership in the days and weeks ahead? Yeah, you are right. It's one of the crucial components. But it, it will take time because a lot of people who are now residing in Armenia, they are from Hadrut, they are from Kashata, from Karvachar, from Shushi, parts of Martuni, uh, Askeran regions, you see, and uh, they lost everything. And uh, of course, we need very much their return, but they have to come and uh, have their houses already. We cannot bring them back and say, you see, uh, you, you have to live in some basement or whatever, in, because uh, it's not a good approach. So we need a, a, a massive construction uh, projects, which will, uh, and as a result, we need to build houses, schools, some kind of infrastructure, and bring them back. We have already, the state has already launched this project and this process in general. Uh, and I know that there are also people from the diaspora who are uh, actively involved in this process. So what we need is to construct within two, three years, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, houses, a lot of schools and infrastructure, and then bring people back but their coming back to a great extent depends on security environment. This is why it's very important that the peacekeeping mission has been carried out by Russia because it's a guarantee 
as a permanent member of the Security Council, as a OSC uh, member of OSC, uh, you know, Minsk Group Troika, etc., etc., as a great power. So we need to carry out a lot of work in economic field, in social and also geopolitical. So we need to complete this kind of project within several years, but uh, not at the cost of quality of these works. You see, so uh, I think that in several years, the material side would be already solved only uh, you know, soft power things will remain, whether to return or not. So the, in this case, we have to work in a different, uh, you know, sphere, uh, cultivating, generating patriotism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot depends on on the personal uh, policy, uh, what kind of cadre policy we are going to carry out, what kind of people are going to deal with these problems. So we need professionals and patriots. These are the key issues which we need. And these are the key uh, foundations of success. Thank you. Arvind. Minister, uh, thank you. I have to say that uh, in, in this period of, of tremendous uncertainty that has befallen the Armenian people and the Armenian nation, and especially Artsakh, I find your vision uh, reassuring. I find your vision inspiring, uh, and I find it fundamentally substantive uh, in that your, uh, the understanding is based both on historical imperative as well as on a very realistic assessment of the conditions on the ground and a real, uh, a real appreciation, I have to say, of the historical moment that we are living in. We cannot you know, we cannot get to yesterday until, uh, uh, get to tomorrow until we've lived through today. And I think today is a challenging moment, uh, but one, I think that uh, at least in terms of our conversation today, uh, I have found uh, meaningfully uh, envisioned. Uh, and I think that there's some real important pillars that you've raised. And I do hope, uh, Minister Babayan, that you will join us again uh, in the near future uh, so we can discuss uh, further, not only the, uh, the work that's being done by the foreign ministry, but how the diaspora can become involved in the patriotic and professional uh, work that needs to be done on the ground uh, uh, with, uh, your, with our compatriots and, and, and with, uh, with your ministry, as well as other ministries, uh, as well as the citizens on the ground. I think that you've really painted a very uh, real assessment of the way forward. And I appreciate uh, the time that you've given us, uh, Minister Babayan. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I would like just to say some final comments. Please. You see, it's a, indeed a crucial period. This is why it's a mission. It's not a work, it's not a job which we have to carry out. It's a mission. And each of us, people who live in Artsakh, who live in Armenia, who live in diaspora, we have to carry out this mission. Maybe it's a biblical one because uh, a lot depends on how we behave ourselves in times of ordeal. You see, if uh, and the potential and the strengths of nation is not only, uh, has not only been demonstrated while you are conquering some territories or whatever, but how can you stay and stand mm. such kind of uh, catastrophic blows, you see? And this is why it's a mission to always stand, to always, uh, you know, recover. And I hope that we, we could do that. Together, of course. Minister, uh, uh, let me thank you. Uh, let me join Karnik in uh, expressing my gratitude for uh, for your roadmap, your vision, and your perspective. And let me take away the following for me and our audience. You said, be true citizens of your host country while maintaining your identity. You spoke of having a bird rather than several in the bush. You sir, uh, you, sir, are the eagle of that homeland, and 
our um, calling is to be the wind beneath your wings. And let's hope that everybody heard you loud and clear. We certainly did. We thank you and we look forward to speaking with you again on or off the air. Have a pleasant day and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr.